thank you everyone for joining um, this session. We're really excited to have everyone uh, to have everyone here. We've had a great, great turnout, great um, number of attendees. So today we are absolutely thrilled to have Leonardo Bamaki uh, to discuss his recent paper, Schumpeter's Creative Destruction as a Radical Departure, a New Paradigm for Analyzing Capitalism. Um, so Professor Bamaki is professor in the Department of um, uh, Economic Evolution at the State University of Rio de Janeiro um, and a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute as well. Um, also with us today, we have uh, uh, Jose Alejandro Coronado, um, who is a research fellow here at IIPP in green financing. Um, and so without further ado, I will hand over to you, um, Leonardo, for uh, the presentation. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks to IIPP, thanks to Mariana. Uh, Antonio, Reiner, Rosie, everybody, uh, Jose, thanks for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my second presentation at IIPP, so it's really nice that I can come back. Um, and let's start because we're already, I think, a little bit late, right? Okay, uh, let me start. I'll start with two claims, okay? The first one is that Schumpeter is a very well-known name in economics, business, and the dedicated media. He's associated with basically two words, innovation and creative destruction. However, the knowledge more or less stops there, meaning Schumpeter's work is virtually unknown. That's my first claim, meaning most professional economists never really read Schumpeter properly or seriously. And that's a big hole. Why? Because Schumpeter has immense relevance for economics and for our, let's call it, troubled times. Okay, my second claim is that Schumpeter's relevance springs from what I'm labeling the creative destruction paradigm, the object of this presentation, which is born in 1942 with his book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. I'll call it CSD from now on. However, again, to fully show its relevance, Schumpeter's relevance, uh, a sort of a reconstruction process is needed and one that collects many ideas and trains of thought and concepts from his previous works, but they only become coherent under the creative destruction paradigm, again, born in 1942. So the presentation will address the second claim that I just made. Let's get going. Okay, so the topics basically will be Schumpeter's vision, his radical break uh, with, let me move this screen here, I think it's going to be better, not really, okay, 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 Schumpeter's vision, uh, Schumpeter's radical break, which is uh, what I will label the, I'm labeling the creative destruction paradigm, and a summing up and uh, conclusions. And I, my core assumption here is that there is nothing so practical as a good theory. So a good theory is always a good way to uh, understand what's going on, a theory that has empirical meaning. And I think Schumpeter provides that to us. Uh, the problem is that to read Schumpeter uh, is it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tall order because he has a lot written on, you know, the, the classics are those three books. But if you want to go a little bit further, you have at least those other three two through uh, collection of essays and the very big uh, history of economic analysis. So, so Peter himself uh, poses a uh, sort of a problem in terms of properly reading him because he wrote a lot and he's not 
he's really not a, an easy read. But anyway, uh, I will say he's very ill, not well, ill known uh, by the, the profession. Let's start with uh, his, his uh, let's call it his vision, right? Uh, let me try to put this here. Ah, now it's good. Okay. Uh, first thing, capitalism is a, form of, is a form of private property economy in which innovations are carried out by means of board money, which generally implies credit creation. So innovations change, credit, debt. That's the beginning of the story. It's a very, very contemporary and useful way of defining capitalism. The money market, so the financial market, is the headquarter of the capitalist system. This is where development comes from, or it can just not come from. But anyway, the financial system is the headquarter of capitalism. I think, again, we live in this kind of world. The credit system has grown and prospered, financing innovation, financing new combinations. And it doesn't matter that today the credit system finances a lot of financial innovation. It's still true that innovation and credit are really crucial elements in a way that Schumpeter defines capitalism. Again, I think it's very useful, it's contemporary, and I think it's kind of lost in the current debates. And capitalists, the real capitalists are the bankers, the money managers, the people who really are inside the financial system. Again, couldn't be more uh, contemporary and relevant the way I see it. So summing up, capitalism, primarily a financial system. Credit, competition, innovation, and institutions are key building blocks of the way it works. Money and credit creation are endogenous features of the financial system. Credit, not savings, is a key element for investment to take place. Development equals change, turmoil, and structural transformation. Development is not linear. Development is not harmonious. Development is conflict. Development is trouble. And stability. Stability is destabilizing. Capitalism is a victim of its own success in the sense that it transforms itself, it ends up transforming itself in what some people will call socialism, but not because it failed, but because it succeeded. Oh, this is again, a very interesting, let's say, take that I think should be much more explored than it is. The basic model is there. Finance, credit creation, debt, and then we go to entrepreneurship which implies vision and strategy, and now we know also organizational capabilities. Only there, only from that, we get into competition and innovation, all types of innovation. And then the results, dislocations, geographical dislocations, profits, winners and losers, conflicts, and then structural change. All that subject to a policy framework and to an institutional form, framework, which are not at the core of St. Peter's model, but this is finance, entrepreneurship, competition, innovation, and structural change. The major problem with this until CSD 1942 is that St. Peter's theory is in the end incoherent. And why is that? because he's, he tries and tries and tries to blend equilibrium and structural change or Marx and Valhar. And this is an impossible task. And he only gets rid of this in 1942. So 
that's one of the problems in terms of like uh, building up a coherent Schumpeter and a coherent Schumpeterian theory. He needs a reconstruction. And that's what I will try to get to. And I will depart precisely from capitalism, socialism, and democracy, okay? Uh, what I'm saying is in the first chapter of the, the book that I edited with uh, Reiner, uh, the, the supporting paper that you have in front, uh, that, that, that you can read, is a second version of that. But those other books, Macron and, and, and Agion, they, are, they, they don't have the same, they are not operating in the same paradigm that I am, but they obviously, uh, we can establish dialogues with them. So that's why I putting it there. Well, and I'm following on the steps uh, of the great economist, Nathan Rosenberg, which gave this paper in Kyoto in the Schumpeter conference, I, if I'm not mistaken, in 1992, where he show, he says uh, to a Schumpeterian, who is an audience uh, filled with Schumpeter scholars, what he's saying is that it's my intention to show that the later Schumpeter, the author of CSD, held views that were not only radical, but deserve far more serious attention than they receive today. Or even, or perhaps, especially, and that's obviously a provocation, from scholars who think of themselves as working within the Schumpeterian tradition. I will say this is as true today as it was when Nathan said it in Kyoto. Obviously, Nathan, uh, Nathan Rosenberg, uh, Nelson and Minter, and, and, and the great Chris Freeman are the big, the three big names behind the, let's call it the Schumpeter revival. So that's why I'm just putting those books over there, just to remind us of something that, well, people who are in the Schumpeter business would know. Uh, what is then the creative destruction paradigm? Well, we all know the, 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 this quote, those quotes, right? Uh, the fundamental impulse comes from innovations. Innovations are sort of the, the engine of growth. And the process of creative destruction is, is the essential fact about capitalism. What is that? Competition by means of innovation and innovation introduced by means of credit. That is the way the system works. And that's the way every capitalism, capitalist firm has to live in and it has to cope with this. Okay, what are the building blocks of this paradigm? First, obvious, is the essential fact is competition by means of innovation, creative destruction. The name in itself says much, so it says a lot, winners and losers, turmoil, conflict. Competition by means of innovation replaces cycles. Schumpeter's uh, previous theories, they were cycle theories and they get worse. They're really bad in business cycles where he tries to put together three types of cycles, the Kondratiev, the Juglars and the Kitchens and uh, tries to uh, blend this with some sort of equilibrium framework. It didn't work. It worked very badly. Now, cycles are gone. Competition by means of innovation replaces cycles as the key element of the system dynamics. And then uncertainties abound. There is no certainty in that process. Competition spreads not only from existing competitors, but from potential, potential competitors as well, which means innovations imply radical uncertainty. Obviously, we have a very nice link to Keynes here, a link that was not properly uh, worked out, but it's there. And it can be, and I think it should be. Uh, potential competition, then we can, re we, we can paraphrase, uh, who said that? Well, uh, the known unknowns, right? This is the, the, the competitors that are not there, but they, they will come in and they will take the place of incumbent firms. So uncertainties are everywhere. Perfect competition, on the other hand, is totally, completely thrown away and is labeled as basically inefficient if 
it ever came to exist. And Schumpeter is exercising a sort of a self-criticism when he says that, because he knows he wrote a lot about perfect competition. Bigness, on the other hand, is efficient. It provides growth and it also provides a win-win solution for capitalists, works, workers, consumers, and governments in the sense that everyone can win with that sort of Schumpeterian package. I will get back to that. And in this environment, super profits are not like super exploitation. They are the seeds of not, they don't have to be, it's not uh, inexorable, but they often are the seeds of super investment. And perfect competition, on the other hand, is labeled as textbook fiction. Uh, again, another way of self-criticize, self-criticism that Schumpeter is doing. Monopolistic practices, which means all oligopolistic structures, market markup, manipulation, product differentiation, patenting, and other practices are understood, uh, again, not as inefficiencies, but as competitive strategies, rather than, well, the traditional models of oligopoly as inefficiencies. No, monopolistic pile power is there, and it yields not only profits, but also resilient rents. Here we have a tricky point. Rents accrue from income derived from the control of scarce assets, real scarcity rarity, which is rare, or much more common today, artificially created scarcity by means of trade secrets, trademarks, intellectual property, and other property rights. Well, both the Chandler and Chandler team and the David Tis, they exploit uh, in a very nice way the sort of the, the, the corporation that Schumpeter announces in that book, but doesn't develop. But those two bodies of work, they are very useful to get the conversation going, get the sort of the the, the history and the theory, uh, mo mostly the history, but also the theory in, in that regard. So profits as aggregates, they move, they tend to move along with aggregate demand, but they're highly volatile within corporations, not uh, some corporations, obviously, the, the, pro the, the profits go up, up and away and others just go bankrupt. Big corporations, they become more re resilient by combining profits and rents in terms of building competitive strategies. Rentism alone tends to stifle innovation, but innovation and potential competition tends to keep, them, keep it in check. This is something that Schumpeter never really developed. It's there, it's, but it's mostly footnote material. And we know that this is a whole in his sort of theorizing. Why? Because we live in a world that is populated by rentists and rentist in rentists institutions. So this obviously needs updating, but it's there. So rentism alone is not a good idea, but rentism, but, but rents and profits, when they are subject to true competition, then you have growth and structural transformation as the result. Two interesting books on that regard are these. I obviously am not gonna say anything about uh, any of them because we don't have time for it. Profits and surplus. This is sort of a, 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 a provocation, a clear provocation to Marxism. Uh, what Sean Peter says, it, it, it doesn't develop this very much, but again, I think that it should be developed. What he proposes is that, yes, profits, you can say that they, they, they derive from exploitation, but the capitalists, the entrepreneurs, collectively speaking, they largely create what they exploit, meaning, Innovation is what they do, and they exploit 
the productivity and the results of innovation. And the workers are there, but they are not the heroes. The heroes are the true Schumpeterian entrepreneurs. A note here, this statement suggests, Schumpeter doesn't do that, but this suggests that any theory of value should bifurcate into two branches. One, value creation. The second, value extraction. Value creation should link with knowledge, productivity, and growth. Value extraction with asset control, monopolization, and market power, issuing rents. Uh, my take is that big business operates with both, which means that within corporate capitalism, competition and regulation should be linked. They are, or they should be, two sides of the same coin. And of course, this discussion is coming back, okay? Three books that are, that, that, that contribute to that, Mariana's book on the value of everything, uh, Bill Azonic and, and Sheen and, and Christopher's are just three of uh, a bunch of books that are coming in recently, and they are so resuming this discussion that was lost for a lot, uh, for, 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 for a good amount of time. Okay, back to the building blocks. Within the financial system, the money supply credit mostly is endogenous and results for the working from the workings of the financial system. Again, forget savings. Savings has nothing to do with that. Credit still important to fund investment, but retain, re, retain profits, rents, and IPOs, which means financial, financial instruments, become key corporate elements in terms of uh, get the corporation moving. We still are, we still are in the realm of the financial system. It just got, it just gets more sophisticated. Credit and financial innovation, they, they accelerate growth, but they also bring financial fragilization. This is clearly something that Hyman Minsky will develop later. Minsky, let's not forget, was uh, a student of Schumpeter. His thesis was firstly supervised by Schumpeter. So the seeds of Minsky's uh, financial instability hypothesis are in Schumpeter in a, in a, in a hidden chapter in uh, Business Cycles, the first volume called The Secondary Wave. It's clearly there, but Minsky is the one who really developed that. Two books, again, who are useful for that are these books, uh, just for reference, not time for any comments on them, on any of them. Investment opportunities, they're constantly recreated by innovations and by all types of innovations, not just like tech, tech, hardware, hardware or, or stuff like that. All kinds of innovation, processes, products, financial, organizational, legal, political, institutional, they can be radical innovations, then key, they, they can be incremental innovation. Is a, what Schumpeter is proposing is a general theory of competition, which is something that economics doesn't have to, to the day. It doesn't have a really good general theory of competition. The seeds are there in the creative destruction paradigm. This is my claim. Development unfolds in waves. So cycles, big cycles, Kondratiev's, etc. forget them, they're gone. So cumulative technological revolutions, they are the ones who really matter and they are the ones who rejuvenate the economic landscape, creating and recreating, again, investment opportunities. So when investments are not going to be needed anymore, when we will have investment saturation from, in, from a Schumpeterian perspective, never, because technological revolutions are always recreating investment opportunities. Two, two very nice books on this are uh, Freeman and Lausam and uh, Mokir, Level of Riches. Implications from what I just said. Uh, there are fluctuations in economic activity, but not regular cycles, recurring, well-behaved 
cycle. And of course, in this kind of environment and within this kind of dynamics, equilibrium is irrelevant because change, because, well, development means change. That means structural transformation. That means turmoil. And that meets resistances and produces conflicts. Nicholas Calder, one of the last things he wrote was a booklet called Economics Without Equilibrium. In his last chapter, has a very uh, uh, a lot of nice bridges with this sort of thinking. But Calder never quoted Schumpeter. I don't think he, he he was very well acquainted if he was with Schumpeter. But it, it provides a nice link in between what a Keynes, Keynesian uh, is saying in his mature work and what Schumpeter is also proposing in his mature work. The other book uh, by Bajuma is mostly about resistances to innovation, why innovation is a very difficult process, why most innovation innovators end up in the bankruptcy courts and not exactly as a Bill Gates or say Sergey Brin or Elon Musk or whatever, uh, Jack Ma. Uh, so the creative destruction paradigm, again, re allows for uh, allows for a win-win situation in terms of surplus creation and distribution. If the Schumpeterian development package succeeds, it doesn't have to, to succeed, but if it does, every economic aggregate improve, improves. Profits, real wages, productivity, variety, quality, dividends, stocks, consumption, and fiscal revenues, they can all, they can all rise. While prices and efforts spent to produce and deliver the goods, they fall. Two books that document this in a very, very nice way are very well-known books, Chandler and Team, Big Business and the Wealth of Nations, and the classic from London's Unbound Prometheus. In that framework, big profits are, along with credit and IPO, the seeds of big investments, job creations, and robust growth. And while individual entrepreneurs still play a key role in carrying out innovations in both uh, business cycles, well, theory of economic development, business cycles, and CSD. In, the, in, in business cycles and CSD emerges the entrepreneurial function. It's not only the entrepreneurs, the persons, but the function that matters most. In corporate capitalism, uh, the entrepreneurial function uh, supersedes the individual entrepreneur. And that includes the state as an entrepreneur, which is not a team that Schumpeter uh, puts in, let's say, at the center of his thinking. But it's there in all the historical chapters that he wrote for business in business cycles. And it's there even more in capitalism, socialism, and democracy, but mostly in the socialist section and not so much in the capital in the, in the section that the, 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 the deals with capitalism. Uh, for instance, in business cycles, he, 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 he puts this rhetorical question, was it not in Germany, the state rather than the entrepreneur which initiated more than industry? And the answer is yes. And similar answers would have to be given for other countries. So the, the state, not the entrepreneur, was the initiator of modern industry. And there is a nice, interesting comment about Brazil, which one could say, well, this is Schumpeter uh, sort of uh, uh, being a kind of a, a, a pioneer in MMT, because what he's saying, government fiat, government, governments can finance directly uh, enterprise, private or public enterprise, uh, by doing what? Well, by just printing money or just uh, crediting the banks or the firms, etc. And 
The concrete example is the Brazilian government that did that for coffee plantations in the 70s, well, 1870s, and it worked. So obviously Mariana's book uh, is a landmark in this. She, she doesn't bring it directly back to Schumpeter, but she raised the flag. So I'm not putting Mariana's book here because it's sufficiently, sufficiently well known to be there. But two other books that put the state at the center of German industry, the first one, Livy, and the collection by Fred Block and Keller, which puts the state at the, at the center of innovation in the US, okay? Implications in terms of institutions and stability. Well, with equilibrium out, institutions become crucial to explain instability. Meaning, instability is an institutional construct. It is not a natural feature of the economic system like equilibrium is supposed to be coming from the neoclassical perspective. No, stability has to be built and how it's built. It is achieved through institutional adaptation, shared expectations, corporate governance, rules, regulations, and policy intervention is complex. And that's why capitalism is not stable. Two books that are interesting in that regard. One is North, uh, one of his last books, and this one by Arena and, and, and Hagener, because uh, economic development and institutional change is, is the, the, the sort of the subtitle of the book. And surprise, surprise regarding North. North is uh, taken as being the, dio the, 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 the major figure for very well-established neoclassical economists as the one who made the link in between institutional economics and neoclassical theory. Wrong. In this book, what North is saying right in the preface of the book is this, the economic paradigm, meaning neoclassical theory was not created to explain economic change. We live in an uncertain and ever-changing world that is continuously evolving in new and novel ways. Standard theories are of little help in this context. And in this book, he starts to wave his hand to some neo Schumpeterians or Schumpeterians, for instance, like Nelson and Winter. So, no, so institutions and neoclassical theory, forget it. They, they don't go well together. So the core math, from Schumpeter, the core message on institutions uh, is that they are the tools, the main tools for building stability in a creative destruction environment. However, stability, as said, is not an assured feature of the system, but the result of a complex set of shared expectations, legal organization, and policy arrangements. However, again, these institutional constellations, if they are not constantly updated, they often tend to become outdated and therefore dysfunctional, which means they become destabilizing elements rather, rather than stabilizing features. So it's a complex relationship, but I think that's the, the way the world works. Two books that deal with that, not directly the way I'm doing, but they are very useful in that discussion are Lowsby and Blockland. And then I sum up and conclude, okay? That would be, what would be a Schumpeter? Maybe it's, I think it should be a Schumpeter Keynes Minsky blueprint in terms of, okay, a reconstructed Schumpeter, Minsk, Keynes and Minsky in terms of building up a creative destruction paradigm. So capitalism is, is, is a historical process in which change, not equilibrium, is the most relevant feature. Change, therefore, should be the object. Change, not equilibrium, should be the object of investigation in any evolutionary research program. Economic agents are creative and not react reactive. And firms, the main economic units, are agents of transformation. 
competition understood as rivalry among firms, but also as a selection mechanism, is the engine that propels economic change. Innovations are the main fuel of that engine. Credit and innovation, they function both as levers of riches and as uncertainty creators. Their interplay is at the root of the systems twin operating features, progress and conflict. Financial innovations are central to financial evolution, yet they are also key to unstable, financially fragile, and often financially unsustainable development processes. This is Hyman Minsky. Financial fragility, Minsky again, springs from the relationship among financial innovations, indebtedness, cash flows, and uncertainty. Profit rates tend to differentiate, not to equalize every other economic theory posts that profit rates in the end tend to equalize. From this, you get the reverse. They tend to differentiate. Why should they equalize? Innovation is always uh, bringing differences and always uh, producing winners and losers and uh, the, the speed that firms grow are very different. Why profits should equalize? They don't. And there is no proportionality law in terms of how much do you invest and how much do you, do you earn. There is no such a thing. There is uncertainty. Institutions and public policy are the main tools for building stability through the establishment of conventions, rules, regulations, which all of them create regularities and conversions of expectations. Regul However, regularities and stability are not fixed as said, but rather evolving, an evolving result of complex institutional arrangements and policy measures, which can turn into destabilizing forces in a creative destruction environment. States, finally, more precisely, entrepreneurial states are pillars of successful development processes. Why? They stabilize expectations, they provide funding, they speed innovations, and they can facilitate entrepreneurial collective action. The main cause of change in the operation of the system in this paradigm runs from policymakers, money managers, and entrepreneurs' decisions to the determination of investment, technological change, productivity, growth, and employment. In one phrase, I think, and I submit that this provides us with a new paradigm and a very, very, uh, unexploited paradigm for analyzing capitalism. And it's time to sort of go, in, go more in that direction. Three books that are useful for thinking in that direction are those three books. And I thank you for your patience and your time. And let's get to, to the conversation and let's get to the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. I think now we'll hand over to Jose um, for some commentary. And then while Jose is speaking, um, please prepare your own comments and questions from the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rosie, for, for chairing the session. And thank you, Leonardo, uh, for, for the very interesting read. I very much enjoyed the, um, the reading of the paper and, and, and I thought it was very insightful. And very, 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 a very interesting um, sort of ideas that you're putting forward. Um, I, I thought that perhaps I could, you know, give some general comments about what I thought were like the very interesting the things that I that caught my eye in the paper um, in relation to my background, and maybe um, ask a couple of questions at the end to sort of like provoke a little bit of discussion uh, and see and see what your thoughts are about about some of the issues that I raise. That you you know discuss to some extent in the paper. Um, so let, I thought. Let, it... let, let me just uh, say, say not not uh, that the sound is not 
super okay. clear. So sometimes it just cuts. Okay, so, so I'll try to I, think I slowly. I might ask you to repeat the question, okay? But yes. Let's go. Yes. In the worst case, I can also write it down. Um, so I thought it was, I'm, I'm mainly familiar with, with Schumpeter's earliest work, uh, particularly theory of economic development, but you discussed that at length in the paper. And um, particularly in the first section, I, I thought that was a very interesting aspect of, 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 of the arguments that you put forward because you identify two moments in his, in his writings, right? Um, the Schumpeter, Pre, um, you know, capitalism, socialism, and democracy, and the post-capitalism, socialism, and democracy, Schumpeter, and um, the main contention, from what I understood, uh, uh, was that this shift or this break occurs due to an attempt by Schumpeter of merging the notions of equilibrium and evolution, which, as you pointed out in the presentation and in the paper, are not really not really, that, that's a reconciliation that is not really possible. So it was, um, so I started pondering to some extent, what, what does that really mean? And you give some likes in the paper about that. Um, um, the discussion about, uh, the discussion about competition, the way that you think about competition, uh, uh, com uh, competition in a more traditional sense uh, in economics is in terms of a perfectly competitive market. And you correctly point out, I believe that under, under a perfectly competitive market, you should expect profit equalization across all the sectors of production. Now, um, that is, uh, this idea of profit rate equalization is uh, qual quite ubiquitous in most of economic theory. Like it, it comes from Smith, is, Marx also picks it up, but also Marshall in its principles of economics and other subsequent authors more tied to the neoclassical paradigm, let's call it like that, uh, advocated for that using, you know, perfectly competitive markets as, as, as a justification for that is. Um, but it, it seems to me that you, 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 you grapple with that and you're thinking a lot in terms of this very neoclassically oriented uh, notion of competition to argue, uh, of equilibrium, sorry, to argue uh, against uh, the need for it in terms of understanding economic realities or modern economic realities. Specifically, you address the fact that according to what you claim in the paper, profit rates are, are not equal. And you use that in order sort of like to discuss also some logical problems in Schumpeter's earlier, earliest work. So uh, uh, an interesting argument that, you, that I thought you were posing uh, was in the context of the cycles of, of, of theory of economic development in which Schumpeter argues that you basically start from a full employment uh, equilibrium situation. Um, you have structural change that occurs through innovation and then a new equilibrium sort of like comes about um, that is sort of like consistent with the Walrasian general equilibrium model, right? Um, but, you, but you point out that this is not really, uh, not really possible. So that, 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 that is something that I want to go, come back to uh, at the end. Um, the other side of the, um, of, of, of the debate that I was uh, very interested in was this idea of a positive sum game, right? Um, so, so the notion of a positive sum game, uh, um, if, I, if I'm thinking, for example, in, in terms of Marx, Marx definitely didn't think that was the case for modern capitalist economies, right? So he, he would envision a situation in which coordination problems occur, in such a way that there's some losers that are pervasively losers and that are consistently losers, i.e. the working class, um, whilst, um, whilst the rest, you know, the rest of the capitalist class will potentially be overall on average, let's say, winners. Um, you seem to, to suggest that there's a situation, uh, if we follow Schumpeter's, this new alternative Schumpeterian paradigm, uh, that we can overcome that uh, and sort of like arrive to a virtuous cycle of um, growth uh, increases. The, the, the sound, not, no, the sound is not good right now. Okay, let me let me repeat that. A virtuous cycle of growth, uh, income, higher income for for everyone, and you know, uh, fall prices and increases in productivity. Um, and I thought so. That's something also that I want to come uh, back uh, at the end. And the last thing that I 
that I that I thought um, it was interesting is these analogs. You, you're, I mean, similarly to Schumpeter to some extent, um, you're always contrasting what Schumpeter is saying with Marx, right? And and these analogs of who, like capital, whether capital, what sort of like economic relationship it structures, um, and you know who is, let's say, the hero, quote unquote, of the story. You you argue that for Marx correctly, in my opinion, the hero of the story is the, is a worker, but also at the same time victim, in the sense that it produces the surplus, but, it, but you know, is not able to enjoy the fruits of the surplus through the capital, capital relation that, they, that it possesses with, with the capitalist class. Well, in Schumpeter, you, you, the class relation that is relevant is, and that is mediated by capital, is the relationship between the banks and the entrepreneurs. And in that case, the, the entrepreneurs are the the heroes of, in the sense of the producers of value, but the victims at the same time, you have this, this phrase, the victims at the same time, because they are not necessarily able to capitalize on the fruits of, of their innovation and, and, and their entre uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial you know, uh, decision-making. So um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop there in terms of what I thought the, the paper was very interesting about, and I'm gonna try to play a little bit of a devil's advocate because I am, I, I'm probably too much of a traditional economist and I do think equilibrium notions are a little bit useful to understand modern economic patterns. Um, so I wanted to hear your thoughts about some particular questions that I have regarding some of the points that I discussed uh, uh, recently. Um, so the first question that I have for you is, uh, why do you think, so you, you seem to be bunching um, authors together when you're talking about equilibrium. So as I pointed before, you seem to be talking about equilibrium in reference to the equalization of the rate of profit, which is perfectly consistent across schools of thought, like you know modern and classical economics, but at the same time, you know, classical theory. Um, but uh, given that you're doing a rereading of Schumpeter, I want to bring into uh, uh, bring into uh, to the surface, a uh, different reading of Marx and the classicals itself um, that sort of like propose a different notion of equilibrium that the one most economists uh, have. Particularly, I'm thinking about the contributions by Fajun and Mancover in their book, Laws of Chaos and Probabil a Probabilistic Approach to Political Economy. And one of the interesting things that they point out is that um, the process of equalization um, um, uh, of profit rates in the classical economies could, can be understood as a process that generates statistical regularities and not necessarily profit rates collapsing into a single value across the entirety of the economy. Um, so why is that I believe important is because this literature through this econophysics literature has produced some seminal works in which uh, um, um, researchers have studied the distribution of profit rates in publicly listed firms, uh, you know, stock market traded firms in advanced capitalist economies. And, you know, one of the things that they've been able to find out is that the, there's a persistent uh, profit rate distribution across sectors over time in, for example, the US economy, which I thought it was different, which is very well characterized by, by um, you know, double exponential type distributions. So um, that's a just to me that maybe what we might be thinking about here is not necessarily an abandonment of a notion of equilibrium, but a reconfiguration on a, or a reinterpretation of what equilibrium is, not necessarily as a single point, as, as in, you know, a single point in which all market or all market clears, all markets clear, I'm sorry, as in the new classical, you know, standard new classical paradigm, but as a persistent statistical structure that we can look uh, over time. And you know this this research that I'm referencing has actually looked at profit rate distributions from like the 1960s all the way to the all the way to 2014. That's that's one of the questions that I wanted. What, what, are, what are your thoughts about that? Why not you know distinguish in between notions of equilibrium? Um, the second question, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit the logic of this virtuous cycle or, or this positive sum game, because from what I understood from both your presentation and and the paper was that profits seem to, you, you pointed out in the, in the presentation that profits seem to be coming from demand, right? Like demand, sort of like profits follow demand. But at the same time, um, you point out that one of the, let's say advantages or one of the incentives that entrepreneurs follow 
um, to, to you know, innovate is due to the fact that they can generate monopolistic profits, right? Some, some version of profits that comes from monopolies. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily understand why in that process that I would expect that that could push uh, prices up in an economy. And I would like to understand a little bit better uh, how the cycle evolves in such a way that it generates, you know, um, a positive sum game for all of the agents in the economy, or maybe there's state in intervention that is required for that, I don't know. And finally, um, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about this, this sort of like class division analogy that you make between um, Schumpeter, the, you, found, you find in Schumpeter, in Schumpeter between the, the you know, entrepreneurs and the, and the banking sector. So one of the interesting things in also, you know, more modern uh, research that has looked at political economy from this, uh, you know, statistical equilibrium type, type of notion is that there's this um, physicist called Viktor Yakovenko who has looked at income distribution. Can you repeat? In... Can you repeat? Yes, yes, of course. Can you repeat the last part, uh, the, the, the new? Uh, the yes. New... So, yeah. yes, uh, I can repeat. So there's this uh, physicist called Viktor Yakovenko who has been looking at income distribution in the US and uh, the UK. So one of the interesting things about looking at income distribution, I mean, original, originally, sort of like the first economist that was looking into this was Wilfredo Pareto, right? Uh, and, and sort of like characterize the distribution of income as a, as a you know, power, as a, as a Pareto, dis, Pareto distribution, sort of, in the sense that the tail of the distribution, that is the, you know, members of society that accure the highest income uh, seem to have a multiplicative effect in the sense that, you know, the more you want, the more money you have, the more likely is it that you're going to move forward in the income distribution ladder. Um, so one interesting thing is that does, you could, again, I, again, uh, Jose, the, the, the sound is really bad. I um, I, I can barely uh, understand what. Yeah, I but, I, I think I, I I got the the message, but uh, well, Leonardo, maybe because I think we're short a little bit short on time. Maybe I can I can leave it with the two original okay. questions that I asked, and maybe you can come back to 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 have a further discussion, if that's okay. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for the questions and. Uh, and, and the comments, they are all very like, 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 like uh, we used to say on the money, they were very, very sharp. So uh, let me begin by the questions, right? Uh, the, the equilibrium question. Well, the problem I see is that most people who work within some sort of equilibrium paradigm, well, they don't go seriously in the work that established what equilibrium is exactly. Meaning, Arrow, De Bruyne, McKinsey, uh, Frank Hunt, because for, for those, uh, equilibrium theorists, or even von Neumann before them, well, equilibrium was something that could be achieved under a very restrictive set of assumptions, and it should not be used as a tool for making this, uh, policy decisions. So equilibrium uh, is uh, sort of the, the life of equilibrium theorizing uh, evolved around three problems. The first, the existence of equilibrium. The second, the stability of equilibrium. I know you know that. I'm just stating it for the general public. And the third, the converge, conversions to equilibrium. The first one, existence. There is a proof that under very restrictive conditions, you can have an equilibrium solution, which is basically a vector of prices. And that's it, it clears the market. The other questions, which are much more complicated, the stability, if, if an equilibrium exists, is it stable? No good answer for that. They themselves admit, we have no good answer for that. Conversions, once the system is not in equilibrium anymore, does it converge? What, what makes, what are the mechanisms 
that provide any sort of conversions back to equilibrium. No good answer for that as well. So, again, they themselves, they warn the others, especially the macroeconomists, that no, this is not something that you can depart from and start talking about economic policy. Because this is a very abstract and very restrictive sort of way of theorizing, is an axiomatic sort of theorizing. If you take that seriously, the big question for equilibrium is the absence of change. The name says it, equilibrium, equilibrium is rest. If a system is in equilibrium, it is, it is it's in the resting point from Newton, from physics. The relevant question for, let's say, the Schumpeter and even for Marx, well, for those who think in terms of development and dynamics, is the reverse. Is, well, what are the mechanisms? What are the determinants? What are the implications of change? So lack of change, equilibrium, change, evolution. To put those things together is really difficult. And to extract policy measures from any equilibrium construct doesn't really go well, even with those who invented equilibrium. So that's why I really don't like, and I don't think they, they are compatible. You can speak about regularities, okay, but regularities, they are, okay, you can have routines, okay, right, but they are easily disrupted. And regularities, I would say, well, you have to bring in stability, and therefore you bring you have to bring in institutional elements. So institutions are the main tools for constructing and understanding stability. Stability again is not a property of the system. Equilibrium theorists would say, well, it's it tends. It tends to, to be stable, but nobody has a proof of that. With, on the other hand, how can you think about stability without thinking about policy, policy interventions and uh, institutions that there are there to, in a way, regulate the system? So that's why I think a radical uh, break, a radical uh, departure has to be made if you want to really think seriously about development, equilibrium is not the proper starting point. And I would, well, and, and like, like North said, after a whole life trying to match uh, neoclassical theory with institutions, he gave up and said, no, it cannot be done. We have to go elsewhere. And where, where he points to, uh, that he would like to go, evolutionary theory. So that's that's my take on that. Uh, and the second one, the positive gain, I think is a very interesting question that you raised. Because yes, I think that in Schumpeter's framework, there is a very compelling case to say that, okay, uh, capitalism, and I would stress can is not going to do it like it's not automatic far from it but capitalism can provide gains for everyone if the system is growing in a way that the distribution of the surplus that is being created this distribution is being properly regulated so politics has to get in and Schumpeter doesn't do that so again it has to be updated but if you have a proper regulation of what is being produced in the surplus you can have real wages uh, going up at the same time that profits are going up at the same time that prices are falling at the same time that stocks 
and dividends are up at the same time that fiscal revenues are up. There is no contradiction among those aggregates. In the aggregate, I'm talking about aggregates. Obviously, individually speaking, you will have the, the, the name set is, says it all, creative destruction. There is a destructive side, winners and losers. So that's why something that has to be developed, and Schumpeter does this in the socialist uh, section of the book. My first presentation at IIPI was about that, it was a paper called Schumpeter, the Entrepreneurial State in China. Because my claim is that what Schumpeter says in the socialist, socialist part of the, the part that he, he, he discusses socialism is completely different from Marx and even from others uh, or other economists which are not Marxists. And it ends up providing uh, a system that can be more efficient, even more efficient than corporate capitalism. And basically because the role of the state is very strong, is very encompassing. So inside that, one of the key elements is what I would call uh, creative destruction management. You have to have, if you have creative destruction, you have also, you have to have creative destruction, you have to manage creative destruction. Why? Because there are losers and winners. So you have to provide ways that the losers, they get the way. You're not going to just protect them, but you have to provide, for instance, for instance, exit policies, retraining, eventually uh, funding for uh, restructuring. All those things are what? Policy, uh, policy and public functions. So with a proper state, with an entrepreneurial state, you can have that. And you, can, you cannot eliminate winners and losers, but you can mitigate that. But you can also have the reverse. So I think a key point that economics missed and is still missing is that the state is essential to understand how the system works. Entrepreneurial states, they can turbocharge growth. Look at East Asia, look at China. On the other hand, rentier states, states that protect the interests of rentiers, they can impede completely development. So underdevelopment is also something that has to do a lot with what kind of state do you have? The state is going to be there. Without a state, you don't have the markets. But that doesn't mean that all states are going to be equal. All states are going to be successful. Rather, the reverse. Few states are successful because there are, there are a lot of conditions to make them so successful. So this positive sum game is something that capitalism can provide. It doesn't mean that it will provide. And then you have to get politics in. And who's going to be in charge of the state? Is it going to be captured by rentists? This is what we're living in. And then, of course, you have inequality. You have uh, much more losers than winners. And you have the state producing not prosperity, but inequality. This is, again, not something that Schumpeter himself did, but that's precise, but, but that can be done under this paradigm. And that's why I'm proposing, we have to get politics in, we have to get some of Piketty's ideas in, we have to get Keynes was the one that said, look, one of the problems of capitalism is, well, it doesn't produce a, a good distribution of income and wealth. And it also doesn't generate employment as it should. So you, we need policy, we need a state. And that converges with Schumpeter, especially if you take the whole Schumpeter, not only what he's saying about capitalism, but he's thinking about the system as a whole. Uh, 
Okay, uh, just very quickly on the break uh, the, that capitalism, socialism, and, and, and democracy represented a, a big break. I think that Schumpeter himself, I think he, he was an unintended break. I don't think he realized that how deep he was going against himself because he wrote this book as sort of a, a, a relaxing from a decade that, that he worked on business cycles. And there he was much more relaxed. And because of that, I think, he could do much more in terms of like thinking different, differently, thinking outside the box, being, being like his ideas flowed, flowed much better in that, in that book. But I don't think he fully realized that he was doing this deep departure. But I think we have to understand that there is this possibility there and we, we should work it out. We, who are, who, who are we? Those who don't think that the equilibrium framework is a very useful one for understanding structural change, development, conflicts, etc., and uncertainty. For those who think that equilibrium is a good way to understand it, okay, you're not, you, not you, but they're not gonna be in the same boat. That's okay. Well, that's a, a sort of a, 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 a position that is not axiomatic. It comes from observing how the system works, how it behaves, and then say, okay, what kind of theory is empirically relevant, empirically consistent? And I would say, well, this one, the evolutionary, the Schumpeterian one is much more empirically uh, consistent and relevant, but it has to be, again, one, reconstructed, and number two, updated. Um, profits, yes, I think because the equilibrium and all the different types, Marshallian equilibrium, Varazian equilibrium, the sort of uh, new Keynesians or even uh, rational expectations types of equilibrium, because they departed from this, constructions, these theoretical frameworks, we, re we really don't have a very good theory of competition to our days. We don't. It's always about perfect competition or any sort of deviation, which is called imperfect competition. Economics doesn't have a very good theory of competition, apart from the Schumpeterian, which is not properly, is, it was not sufficiently developed. It's still something that needs developed needs to be developed. Also, we don't have a good theory of profits. Think about it. Who, who, which school, which, which, which sort of, which branch of economics has a really good theory of profits? I would say we don't have. This is still lacking. That's why I think Schumpeter's stake, which is very preliminary, just like the very beginning. Well, capitalists, they create what they exploit. That means that exploitations, mar, mar, exploitation Marx style doesn't exist. Of course it does. Obviously, it's another way to understand profit. Profits can come from pure Marxist kind of exploitation, but it can also kind, come from that sort of Schumpeterian way of conceiving that innovations are, which are providing productivity and are providing, uh, the, the surplus and the workers benefit from that. So in Schumpeter, I think in a provocation, in a clear provocation to Marx, he would say, okay, in Marx system, the workers are the victims and, uh, excuse me, the, the workers are the heroes because they are the ones who produce the surplus, but they don't get it. They, 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 don't, uh, they don't appropriate this, the, the, what they produce. So they are the, the, the heroes and the entrepreneurs are, are uh, the reverse, okay? The entrepreneurs are the ones who uh, get what they did not produce. And Schumpeter reverses that. He said, no, in my theory, the entrepreneurs are the heroes 
but they are also the victims. They are the heroes because they are the, the, the ones that, that, that introducing innovations, they produce the surplus, they produce the improvements, they, they produce for the whole society a, a whole lot of new products, services, et cetera, et cetera, and with lower prices. But when innovation diffuses, then the profit margins tend to contract. And the entrepreneurs and the corporations, they have to be innovating all the time. Otherwise, they go bankrupt. So in that sense, he is toying, he is playing with the Marxist tradition, but in a way that I think is productive. It's something that also deserves more uh, thinking in that, that direction. And there, and, and there is where I think that any theory that's going to be thinking about value you will have to distinguish in between value creation and value extraction. Those are two elements that are not, are not clear in any theory of profit. And lastly, uh, we, we don't even have a, a very well-developed theory of development. Development is something that we, we still, the state is outside all theories of development. It's crazy. Without the state, you don't understand development or underdevelopment. But economic theory excluded the state by definition. And so we still have a lot of ground to cover if we opt for what I'm labeling as the creative destruction paradigm. But this is sort of something that, again, and I'll finish, uh, still has to be developed. And it will have to, to include a reconstructed Schumpeter and at least Keynes and Minsky. And I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think we are actually getting close to needing to wrap up, but I think Jose might have one further question. We don't have any questions so far from the audience, um, but in case there is anyone who has a question, speak now or forever hold your peace or rather write in the, um, in the Q and A box if you can. Um, otherwise, perhaps I'll hand over to Jose for another final question and then we can wrap up. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, thank you, Leonardo, for your answers and your comments. I was just uh, wondering, one of the things that caught my attention in, in, in your answers and your presentation, now that we, you put the, the topic of development and the need for the state to, to occur development as a, as a subject in the talk, you referenced um, what the Brazilian government did with the coffee plantations in the 70s, I believe, um, correct? So. Uh, as a as a as a way um, as a way to understand or or, 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 or as, let's say a piece of evidence in favor for for MMT, um, so I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on on, on what are your thoughts about um, the possibility or the feasibility of of you know spurring innovation through you know money printing in in countries like you know Brazil where I presume you're from or Colombia where I'm from. Where you have uh, balance of payments constraints and you have foreign constraints that will, you know, devaluate, you generate a devaluation spiral, or that we could create potentially a, you know, foreign debt crisis. Oh yeah, yeah. In in countries like ours, obviously, a tool that it's missing. It used to be there, but it's not there anymore. It's called capital controls. Why do we have this problem? because we don't have capital controls. Capital controls are very useful in situations where sim uh, capital is simply flying because it, it, it came in to seize a profit, a short-term profit opportunity and went, it went away. In case, in that case, why not put their capital controls? So if you have that, then you automatically will stabilize uh, exchange rates, right? And in that sense, if you have that, then the state obviously, it gains much more uh, policy space. And in doing that, it can obviously uh, finance things in the sort, of, uh, the sort of money that it prints, it creates. It doesn't really print, it just 
computer entries. So it, it, the state, as we know, it doesn't have a budget constraint, but it can have a problem, obviously, if, if, it, if it has an external debt, we all, we all suffered that. So don't do that. Don't try to get uh, a lot of uh, external debt in, 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 a, in a sort of a currency that you don't produce. Don't do that. And the other thing is, well, uh, use capital controls when you need. Because why uh, capital should be completely free to do whatever it wants uh, under the sort of under the assumption that it will always be allocating itself in the most productive uh, environments and sectors and activities. We obviously know that this is not true. So, and, and policy is there to do what? To enable development. It's not something, capital control is not something that you're gonna be using every single day but you can use it when needed. Look at China or even, well, look at the other, uh, 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 other Asian countries and look at our own countries in the past. We made good use of capital controls and we made bad use of capital controls. It's a, it's a sort of, uh, you have to learn and you have to use it the proper way. Are you going to make mistakes? Yes, everybody makes mistakes. But just to state it out that capital controls is, they are bad. And so they are gonna be, they have to be out. This is pure ideology linked with money interests, private money interests coming from the financial system. Why do we have to believe that? I don't, I don't think we have a very good empirical uh, uh, record to back that sort of uh, policy receipt. Thank you very much, Rosie. Yeah, thank you very much, Leonardo. I think um, we still don't have a, a, any questions in the Q&A. So unless Jose, you would like to come back um, with a response. I think we probably have time to, or it's time to wrap up. So thank you very much, Professor Bolamaki. This has been a really enlightening uh, uh, presentation and discussion. And thank you also, Jose, for your amazing questions and, and deep reading of the text. I think we can all agree yeah. that that, that was really valuable. Thank um, you very much. Thank you all, and I hope to be back in the future. Thank you all. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely, we love we love hosting you at IIPP. So so thank you very much. <laughs>